Chapter 1 You've probably lost something at some point in your life. Everybody has. It could be something as simple as a set of keys, or it could be something as important as a wedding ring. With those two examples, of course, I'm only listing material objects. Regarding the unfortunate case of one construction worker named Earl Price, he lost his child. Now, don't mistake this for some morose tale about a single working-class father losing his daughter. This is rather a relegation of the apocryphal nature of the mysterious circumstances. Per the factual occurrences regarding Earl Bryce, it was the mid to late thirties. He was part of the infrastructure crew, the maglev team, out replacing the old railway lines installed a century earlier in the 1930s. They were upgrading the old concrete and rail lines that stretched out across America. Everything had to be up to the new 2035 specifications for the all-electric maglev systems. Bullet trains that ran on electromagnetic impulses, completely self-driving cars, which were powered by electricity. Never again would the proletariat pay for the privilege of transportation. Infinity presented itself. So, it was the mid to late thirties when Earl Bryce made his way home, noting that the ideas promised in the 1950s about self-driving cars and helpful robots and magnetic railways, all with little to no pollution, these concepts finally found fruition. Granted, humanity was, by choice or by design, seemingly always a century behind what their imaginations could conceive. Just another man thinking these thoughts, Earl Bryce was struck by tragedy. Not all in their lives experience loss, but most do. He had lost his wife in childbirth, forcing him to raise his young daughter on his own. Upon coming home on this particular day, Earl found his daughter missing. He dropped his electromagnetic tools on the floor, screaming out her name, searching madly to no avail. Earl then called the authorities to commence a formal search for his child. The police set up a trace. Her hollow phone GPS had placed her last location at the Central New Wave district in the downtown area. It was being rebuilt after the electromagnetic pulse attack of 2031. So what the hell was his daughter doing down there? With no answers... Earl Bryce, along with a police detective, hovered in a hyperchopper down to the factory area. This is where the detective informed him that it was unlikely his daughter would ever be found. The EMP-31 section was not a safe place. However, he kept up the search. For days, weeks, as any father would, months went by. Destitute and alone in his apartment, he'd taken to the 3DVR council, becoming addicted to its immersive nature. Earl Bryce became trapped in his memories, trapped with his dead wife and his missing child, keeping company with his electric ghost, as his very body withered, his muscles wasting away after months of disuse. Earl abused the holographic memory machine as he sat in the corner, barely eating, his very bone tissue softening, reliving 3D reality simulated memory display images in his headset. A friend decided to intervene, a detective whom had helped Earl before, and thereupon this friend disconnected the headset. He set about cleaning up Mr. Earl Bryce, which took considerable time, but he eventually sat Earl down in front of the WebNet terminal to show him something. The holographic display commenced a search, 
and, though Earl was uncomfortable with this at first, the sight displayed hinted at something quite strange. Something Bryce hadn't expected. It was possible for him to be reunited with his wife and his daughter. It was something Earl couldn't possibly believe in. It was time travel. Chapter 2 He awoke, and it was dusk. He yawned and stretched. He holstered his stub-nosed, six-shot revolver, and went about his evening routine, getting a cup of coffee, checking the hollow feed for news, disarming the EMP security system. He didn't feel truly awake or alive until he stepped outside. He stared up at the magnificent cityscape. The endless blinking neon skyscrapers were in a rebuilding phase. They still stretched up to the pink and fuchsia-colored cotton candy clouds as vague indigo and purple rays cast about their last glow. On hover cars and steam levs down below, people had conquered the epidemics, and while most folks were wearing masks, the pedestrians were also clothed in retro-mod garb. Men and women of each ethnicity dressed up to the hilts in ties and hats and scarves and trench coats. The detective reflected upon the fact that humanity always seems to ceaselessly be reaching back into its past for how to best inform its future. All of us dressed like the 1930s and its 2040. The detective cleared his head of the thoughts, as it was easy to be distracted by the megalithic city, this steampunk cyber future. He noted that the aerial lift was hovering toward him, and he jumped up to the platform. He pressed his wrists against the terminal scanner, and the DNA encoder accepted his fare as the auto-nav took over. The detective felt a shudder as the lift rose and soared, into the night sky. It was easier to fly as the crow flies, over the terrestrial electrical grid of the free, but clogged, energy transport lanes. He heard that once, long ago, taxis drove the street, accepting fares and burning fossil fuels for motion. Long since gone, as were the drivers, no lifts or taxis or Ubers ever had drivers any more. The detective made his way to the suburbs, out past the light line and the reaches of the neon skyscrapers, and the amethyst and cobalt skyline stretched out into the wicked darkness. He found the abode of his friend, Earl Bryce, who'd withered away and with whom he'd been involved for some years, having lent a hand searching for his missing daughter. He'd felt sorry for Bryce, and eventually the detective decided to intervene when it was clear that Earl Bryce was an addict of the virtual reality memory machines that were almost completely immersive in their capacity to trap their victims in the past. He knocked on the door. Earl Bryce answered. The detective noted that Bryce was looking much healthier, much more hopeful, since he found the site advertising. Well, come in, Earl offered. Chapter 3 The detective strode into the cluttered and dismal living room of one Earl Bryce. The man, although his wife and daughter had been gone several years now, was still clearly in a state of depression. The detective was happy he'd pulled his friend out of the immediate addiction, but that was only half the job. While Bryce himself appeared to be cleaned and shaven and moderately acceptable, his abode afforded other clues as to his internal mental state. The detective shrugged this part of himself off, as he was not here in his capacity of his formal officer. Rather, he was here as a friend. I see you're starting to straighten things up a bit. The detective set down his empty coffee cup. 
He noted that it didn't really matter if he'd thrown it in the trash. This place was a damn pigsty. Earl Bryce was groggy, but more lucid than he had been in the previous weeks. This Poe project, he said, without acknowledging the detective's observations. What exactly is that? To my knowledge, the detective interrupted. Um, could be some vague reference to Edgar Allan Poe, literary novelist from the late 1800s. Had some dark tales. Okay. Bryce shook his head. So you've looked up this Dr. Uh, Sendek, the detective finished for his friend. Yeah, seems legitimate enough. Nobel contender, apparently he has four PhDs. Quantum mechanics, theoretical physics, particle physics. All right. And astrophysics, I believe, the detective concluded. Okay, I got it. Earl waved dismissively. So how exactly could it be possible to inject yourself with time travel? I mean, it doesn't make any damn sense. The detective nodded. Me either, he shrugged, then motioned toward the door. Ready? I'm as anxious to figure it out as you are. Earl Bryce stopped in the doorway threshold and turned to peer at his friend clearly in the eyes. I'm taking a chance here. The detective noted the shining hope which resided there now in Bryce's stare. He broke the gaze and looked out to the horizon of the cityscape and responded in almost a sigh. Me too. Chapter 4 Murky, purple depths were little comfort as the two friends stepped into the shadowy, lilac hewn silence of the night. Earl Bryce wasn't in the mood to drive, so he sat in the back of his hover car. As the maglev device engaged autopilot, he lit a cigar. The crisp, cool night air was no solace when he cracked the window. Outside were shadows and figures and forms which passed in silence, wreathed in darkness. They could have been derelicts or streetwalkers or statues or garbage cans. Bryce didn't know. The detective could tell Earl was feeling exposed, vulnerable, surrounded, perhaps even a little paranoid. It was to be expected. Luckily, it wouldn't be a long trip. On the left, their vehicle passed by the central Maglev Highway, which separated the natural world from the industrial city. The gnarled, twisted fist of neon blinking lights scraped the heavens in the distance as the last traces of the cobalt and murky lavender and indigo sunset evaporated, and all that was left was the uninviting industrial complex. The pair arrived slightly early, finding that the laboratory of Dr. Sendak appeared as an anonymous metal shed. It wasn't hard to find, though, as it was topped with a copper spire, which crackled static snaps and pops of bleach-white electricity and arctic blue shocks and rhythmic pulses. Apparently, it was a hybrid design of wind, solar, and geomagnetic power but additional energy had to be tapered off, which led to this eyesore. It looked like the remnant of some positively ancient science fiction film. Once every second, as in the ticking of some millennial clock, it undulated with these bizarre snapping, crackling electric shocks. But the detective's four knuckles were allowed to rap on the rusty, industrial gray door. It opened, revealing a man of middling height and dark complexion. He was bald but sported a curly beard and had a face built for grinning, which he did often. The detective noted the pearly white teeth and surmised that Dr. Sindak either had holographic implants or the man never smoked or drank. They were invited inside and the lab was meticulous. Every item was stowed in a particular place, 
and everything was metal gray or industrial chrome or some variant of silver. Bizarre contraptions with blinking lights and odd devices all recessed into the wall made the visitors feel as if they had boarded an alien vessel, some UFO from a century ago. This didn't go unnoticed by Dr. Sindek. Nodding at them, he noted that his place wasn't the most inviting. Although a bit scientific and detached in a clinical, hospital-like atmosphere, Sindek concluded, I apologize. I see I can be a bit overwhelming for most, but let me invite you into my private parlor. He was trying to be warm and conciliatory. It wasn't working. Earl Bryce held up a hand before going forward. Look, I read your article. I just want you to know, I'm not here for a social call. I mean, this nonsense about traveling and time by injecting yourself with particulate matter? Is it legit? The detective placed a hand on Bryce's shoulder. I had to pull a lot of strings to get you here, pal. Hear the man out. Earl and the detective looked at Sindek. His smile faded slightly, but he nodded. Yes. He had drug out his whys with wavering confidence. It's difficult to put in simple terms, but this would basically be a test run. Bryce seemed heartbroken. The detective nudged him lightly and put his hands on his hips, tan trench coat flapping behind him like a superhero cape. I'm not going to watch you hook yourself up to that memory machine again and get lost. This time, you may not come back. Earl nodded. The detective continued, You're going to try this, or you're going back to the rehab program, and I know you don't want that. I know, Bryce snapped. Oversight and overseers, restricted movements, no drinking, no car, war to the state under house arrest. Yes, the detective nodded. So I made a special arrangement. I'm here as your friend and as your constabulary. I can look the other way, see if this is maybe could work. Dr. Sendek broke in, his arched eyebrows and his welcoming smile arriving before his words. At the very least, we can all be on the news. 